Amen. Thank you. Let's bow together and pray. Father, we're so grateful for Jesus and for the opportunity to gather. What a privilege it is for the church, the called out ones, to gather in the name of Jesus. We pray for those who are joining us online and just pray, God, for health and safety for everyone. Lord, those who are here and those who are still at home, just pray, God, that uh, you would... Make the day hasten, Lord, when we can all get together and uh, worship you again. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful good news of Jesus. Thank you for today, Pentecost Sunday, the celebration of the coming of the Holy Spirit, which birthed the church, empowered the disciples, and changed the world. And I pray, God, that you would fill us as we worship and fill us as we leave, that we might speak the name of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom of God, in his name we pray. Amen. Well, there's an info tab on your worship folder. Please tear that out and fill it out and drop it in that box on the back wall along with your tithes and offerings. You have an insert of the One Minute with God. There are also large, larger ones back in the foyer for June if you want to get those. And uh, Celebrate Recovery is starting up this week on Tuesday night. And Tom's going to speak to that here a little later. And uh, so we're thankful for that. Uh, Sunday school classes are starting to uh, meet face-to-face, -face, uh, at least in part. Not all of them, but some of them. We're thankful for that. 
the work is done on the two walls, I think, not on the back wall, but the side walls, I think, are completed with the painting, and we're thankful for getting that done. Uh, the graduates who are graduating today, in fact, right now their graduation is going on, and we're thankful that they could have a place to do that, and we celebrate them. Next week is our Graduate Recognition Sunday, and we'll have a special time of recognizing our graduates. We'll also have the Lord's Supper, and we'll have individual Lord's Supper cups there in the pews for you to use uh, for everyone's safety. And so, uh, I'm sorry? Yes, you do. Grief Share meets tonight at 5.30, at 5 o'clock, in the Fellowship Hall, and you have one more meeting? This is the last one, okay. So tonight, Grief Share has their final meeting. And so, uh, as you know, most of the things of the summer have been uh, canceled or postponed. Our mission trip to Hemis Springs, we found out this week, is also going to be canceled. Uh, and so we're looking forward to next year, perhaps. But uh, we're just going day by day, like all of you, wondering... Uh, when is everything going to change and when's it going to be safe and how are we going to be safe to do it but we're thankful you've come here to worship today and uh, david and denise Dunahoo and their grandson the handsome reed heiser are going to come lead us in our minute with god and so you listen intently to them they're going to use your mind Our Minute with God scripture for today is found in Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And our question for today is, do you know anyone who seems to have run out of hope with whom you might share the promise of the Holy Spirit? So if you'll just discuss that question with someone next to you. Okay, before we pray, uh, just remember to uh, ask God to, in, uh, to empower you by His Holy Spirit, by His Spirit, and to share the great hope that you have in Him. And I'll lead us in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you um, as Christians that when things not are always going well, that we have the hope of our salvation and of our Jesus Christ to lean on and to be able to share that with the people that may not understand or may not have that awareness or that relationship with God. And Lord, we just pray that we can share that with them, uh, especially now in times that uh, what all we're going through today and uh, in the future, Lord, that uh, there is hope and there is peace with that hope. And we praise your name in Jesus Christ.
praise an ending be yours be yours forevermore praise an ancient praise an I want to 
Amen. I'm going to ask Tom Morton to come up and give us just a word about Celebrate Recovery. And uh, we're so excited that ministry is starting back. And Tom, come speak to us. something and it's been said that we Christians are all recovering from something um, and one of the worst things we can do when we're in that situation is to uh, is to isolate and all of us have been isolated to some degree for some long while now so in view of that we're we've decided to reopen celebrate recovery starting this Tuesday um, you know, if you, if you have any hurt habit or hang up that uh, maybe one you're, you've been struggling with a long time or maybe a new one that's popped up since you spent all this time by yourselves the last couple of months, I want to invite you to come to celebrate recovery on Tuesday evening. Our meeting will begin at 6.30, but this Tuesday at 5.45 we're going to have pizza. Uh, so I want you to come and see if the program has anything to offer you. Uh, we believe strongly in the program. We've seen a lot of lives change. Some of the folks are sitting right here with us today. Uh, and uh, it's been a great experience for me, not only to think I may have helped somebody else, but, but the, the possibility that I, I too have grown spiritually. Uh, you know, we, we have a, 
one of our steps says uh, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. And I hang my hat on the word try and the word practice. Practice, practice, practice. So come and practice with us if you will Tuesday night. We're all practicing, right? I hope you are. Uh, either practicing or you're dead because all of us have some things that uh, we're recovering from that uh, have impacted our lives. Let me see if I can get this open. There it goes. Well, <clears throat> Kevin Costner starred in a movie called Field of Dreams. I don't know if you remember. It's about a field corn, a cornfield in Iowa and he hears voices and decides to build a baseball field there. And I don't want to ruin the movie if you haven't seen it, but these dead players come out of the cornfield into the... I know, it's really a dumb idea. <laughs> really dumb idea, but these dead players walk out of the cornfield into the baseball diamond and somehow find some reconciliation of things in their past. And finally at the end, he also finds reconciliation with his dad. And... Uh, it's a preposterous movie, and people are always making fun of him and questioning why, why is he building a baseball diamond in the middle of a cornfield. And I think Jeremiah probably got some of the same kind of uh, response from people of his day because it's, it's now the tenth year of Zedekiah. Remember, Zedekiah was set up as a puppet king in 598 after the Babylonians had conquered and taken a lot of the uh, the upper crust people away and some of the, the, the valuable vessels out of the house of the Lord and the temple. And Jeremiah had told them, you remember last week, the false prophet said within two years, all that stuff's coming back, all those people are coming back. And Jeremiah said, I wish you were telling the truth, but you're not. And sure enough, ten years later now, the Babylonian army is encamped around Jerusalem. And so they're setting a siege that's going to last many months so that the, uh, the food supply dries up, disease becomes rampant in the city, and it is a terrible time. And let me tell you, I don't know a lot about real estate, but I can tell you, if there's an occupying army surrounding your city and about to come in and destroy everything, it's not the time to buy a place. Right? Who would do that? And God has come to Jeremiah and told him, look, your cousin's going to come to you and ask you to buy a field. You're the next of kin. That's the way it was done in Israel. If you're going to sell something, you went to the next of kin first. And God said, I want you to buy it. And sure enough, his cousin comes to him and says, I have this field. I want you to buy it. Now, I don't know who his cousin is, but my goodness, Hannah Mill had to have known this is a bad time for him to be buying anything. I don't know if he thought Jeremiah was a fool or what. Nobody buys real estate when an army's about to destroy everything and occupy the place and shake up everything. But God tells Jeremiah to do it. And he tells him to do it because God says there's coming a time when houses and land and fields will be bought and sold again in this land. Now he's telling them this at a time when Jeremiah is basically prisoner in the king's court and the occupying army of the Babylonians and Chaldeans is surrounding Jerusalem and things can't get in or out. And Jeremiah says, there's coming a time when this is all going to end. So let's read, let's read the whole account. Stand with me out of reverence for the word of God. And let's read Jeremiah chapter 32. If you'll listen fast, I'll read fast, okay? 
The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar, it was at that time the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon. He shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. So Zedekiah says, Jeremiah, why do you keep saying that? I'm going to shut you up so that you can't be around people and tell them that. It's discouraging. It's just demoralizing to people and to the army when the army's outside at, around our city and you're telling the people in the army in the city you need to give up. And, of course, we'd probably felt that same way. I mean, that's not the time, right? But it was the time. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the garden, accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales, and I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard, I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware vessel, that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. After I had given the deed to, of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them, O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty indeed, whose eyes are open to all the ways of the children of men, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, and in this day, in, to this day in Israel among all mankind, and have made a name for yourself as at this day. You, bought, you brought your people out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt with... I'm sorry, you brought your people Israel out of the land of Egypt with, strong, with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror. And you gave them this land which you swore to their forefathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they entered it and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Therefore you've made all this disaster come upon them. Behold, the siege mounds have come up to the city to take it, and because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hands of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs offerings have been made to Baal and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. 
for the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the work of their hands, declares the Lord. The city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke me to anger their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. They set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom. <coughs> Excuse me. To offer up their sons and daughters to Molech, though I did not command them, nor did it enter into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their God and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. For their own good and the good of their children after them, I will make them with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. Fields shall be bought in this land of which you are saying, it is a desolation without man or beast. It is given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Fields shall be bought for money and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and the cities of the hill country and the cities of Shephelah and in the cities of Negev. For I will restore their fortunes declares the Lord. Would you bow with me and pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the core values that held Jeremiah close to your heart, close to your mission, close to your word. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at those core values that are shown in this chapter, that you would help us to examine our own heart and our own life. Because, Lord, when the world begins to shake and things begin to get terrible and trouble is all around, Lord, it's those core truths, those core values that hold us close to you, that keep us from falling apart, that keep us in your wonderful peace. So, Lord, help us to walk in them today. And I pray your Holy Spirit would speak through the powerful Word of God and call us to that kind of relationship, that kind of walk with you that makes life rich. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you and be seated. So there's some core values in this chapter that Jeremiah says and that the Lord says to him that are very important to life. Some core values that hold you when the world seems to be falling apart, and certainly their world is falling apart. Zedekiah is frantically afraid, the king, he's frantically afraid. And so he has shut Jeremiah up where he can't be around people, where he can't speak the truth of God. And yet the word of the Lord has been spoken. The people have heard it for 40 years now. God has been telling them, what was coming, and now they can see it. All I gotta do is look over the walls. They can see it there. And the first core value that holds Jeremiah tightly to God is God's power can do anything. God's power can do anything. Jeremiah says it in verse 17, nothing's too hard for you. God says it in verse 25. 
and, and through 27 here, I am the Lord, he says in verse 27, the God of all flesh, is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for God? It's not, is it? Now, there are things that are too hard for us. But nothing is too hard for God. God can do anything. God has the power to accomplish whatever he wills, whatever he chooses. And one of the things that holds Jeremiah so tightly to the, to the Lord is he has this confidence that if he is on God's side alone, there is more hope and peace and security there than to be with all the rest of the people out of the will of God. Listen, you and I need to have that confidence. It's better to stand with God alone than to stand with everybody outside of the will of God. Because God can do anything. And Jeremiah has that complete confidence in God. Complete confidence that the word God has given him is true. The word God has given him will come to pass that God can accomplish what he says he would do. Nobody believed when Jeremiah started preaching 40 years ago and, and that the economy was good and things looked secure and everything was hunky-dory that judgment was coming. They didn't believe it. And here it is. God can do anything. And now in the time of judgment, God says to Jeremiah, hey, you know what? Good days are coming again after this time of judgment. This is not the end of things. This is not the undoing of everything. Good times are coming again. And Jeremiah believes God's able to accomplish that too. He's able to bring good out of chaos. He says in verse 17, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. God, you just reached out, and spoke, and formed them. You can do it. You can bring something out of nothing. You can bring order out of chaos. You can bring good out of evil. God can do it. Today we celebrate Pentecost, one of the great events in the history of the world. 50 days, and the Jews had celebrated Pentecost for hundreds of years before Jesus came. 50 days after Passover, and they celebrated it as a, a memorial of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, and also a memorial thanking God for the first fruits of the harvest. And so 50 days after Passover, every year, they would go to Jerusalem and celebrate Pentecost. But Acts 2 tells us that on the day of Pentecost, 120 believers were gathered together in an upper room. They were scared to death for their lives. They were praying, as Jesus had told them to pray. But they were hiding away. They were, they were, they were trying to shut the world out and keep themselves safe. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came on them like tongues of fire, the Bible says, and it sounded like a mighty rushing wind. And of course, Pentecost was one of those big Jewish festivals. So Jews from all over the world, who spoke all sorts of different languages, would come to Jerusalem. And the Spirit empowered those disciples to speak the truth of the gospel, the praises of God, in the languages of all those people who had come to Jerusalem. And Peter preached, and 3,000 of them believed and gave their lives to the Lord. And the church was born. So happy birthday, church. Oh, I don't mean the building. I don't mean this particular congregation. I mean the church. The kingdom of God in the world, its presence expressed in the called out ones of God. That started at Pentecost. And it continues today in the power of the Holy Spirit with the same purpose, the same mission that Jesus gave that original group of disciples. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. 
tell the good news to everybody. Be my witnesses in the power of the Holy Spirit. And listen, I know there's great controversy around the Holy Spirit and all those things, but the number one evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is that people spoke boldly for Jesus. They spoke boldly for Jesus. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because God can do anything. I mean, he took that cowering group of 120 disciples and changed the world with them through the power of the Holy Spirit. God can do anything. So Jeremiah has that core belief. Secondly, he has this core belief that God loves to be kind. Not only God's power can do anything, but God loves to be kind. You show, verse 18, you show steadfast love to thousands. God, that's who you are. The Apostle John will write it in one of his letters. God is love. You can't reverse that. And people try to and make a mess of it. But God is the very definition of love. And how he acts is always love. Even when it's judgment, it's love. Because God in his holiness won't let sin go on. Because he loves us too much. You show steadfast love to thousands. Even though the guilt of the fathers comes out in those habits and hang-ups and hurts that are passed on to the children, you and your love seek to redeem, to bring them back. And God has shown this in Jeremiah over and over again. As he says through Jeremiah to these people who have been disobedient and idolatrous and have gone after the things of this world and the pleasures of life and the gods of this age, he said, if you will just turn back to me. You know, the Bible says the reason Jesus hadn't, Jesus hadn't come back yet is that he's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't enjoy destruction. God loves to be kind, and he wants everyone to repent. But now God has set rules. You can't come your own way. You can't come outside of where he calls you. He deals with people according to their deeds, whether they're going to humble themselves and repent and seek his face, or whether they're going to say no to his word and go their own way. And you have freedom to do that if you want to. But let me tell you, it always ends badly. It always ends badly. God loves to be kind. And oh, after Israel had rejected him, you realize those 120 <coughs> who were there in the day of Pentecost were Jews. You know that, don't you? They weren't Gentiles like us. They were Jews. Now, most of the Jews rejected Jesus. And in fact, they nailed him to a cross, put him to death. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on them. They proclaimed the good news. And the Holy Spirit convicted people's heart of their need of Jesus. And many of them, 3,000 on that day, repented and believed in Jesus. And listen, the Holy Spirit is still about that work. God loves to be kind, even this morning. Doesn't matter how far you've gone away, what all you've done, how badly you've messed up your life, how badly you've hurt other people. If you will turn to the Lord with your whole heart, He wants to forgive. He wants to receive you. He is a God who loves to be kind. Jeremiah believed that. And so when God told him, as Jeremiah is locked up in the king's court in a city that is besieged by an army, when God told him, Jeremiah, buy the field because houses and lands and vineyards are again going to be bought and sold in this land, Jeremiah believed him. He believed God didn't want to destroy people. God didn't want to bring judgment. Judgment was a result of the people's sin and unrepentant hearts. But God wanted to be kind. And God promised him there's coming a day when they're going to turn back to me. I'm going to give them a new heart. I believe he's speaking about the Holy Spirit 
and what he does in the life of believers at that point. They're going to come back to me. So God's power can do anything. God loves to be kind. The third core value is that God honors his name. God honors his name. And I don't know if you've thought about that a lot. The name of God, the name of the Lord Jesus are blasphemed often in our culture. They're blasphemed often in our media, in our entertainment. You know, the Lord had said in the Ten Commandments, keep my name holy. Well, God has not changed. God still wants his name to be holy, and he wants a holy people to honor his name. But God will always honor his name. He will not let it be blasphemed. And so these people who have blasphemed it by worshiping idols are about to encounter judgment because they didn't understand the seriousness of how God honors his name. He says here, beginning in verse 20, you have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to this day in Israel and among all mankind. Why did God do that? And have made a name for yourself. God wanted a holy people who would be his people so that his name would be honored in the world. God wants us to be people who serve him and love him with all our heart so that his name will be honored in our world. And God will always honor his name. It's why Jesus said to his followers, people worry about what they're going to eat and what they're going to drink and where they're going to live and what they're gonna, where they're going to go. He said, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. If you'll put the honor of the name of God first in everything, the kingdom of God first in everything, all those other things will fall into place. You won't have to worry about them. God always honors his name. He stretched out his hand and showed signs and wonders in Egypt and brought his people out with a powerful arm and his name was honored. Till they got into the desert, and they got thirsty, and then they started complaining. And God provided water, and they started complaining, and God provided them food, and they started complaining about that, and God provided them meat, and they started complaining about that. Wherever they went, they complained. God wants us to honor his name. God wants us to believe he's going to do what he's going to do. And his sentence on these people is so instructive in verse 23. They entered the land, they took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. They didn't honor his name. They didn't honor his name. Well, what about your life? What about your conversations? What about your family? What about the things you do, your decisions, your choices. Are you honoring the name of Jesus? Jeremiah knew that whatever came his way, he needed to honor the name of the Lord God because God always honors his name. And when you dishonor him, when you disrespect him, when you turn your back to him and not your face, oh my goodness, we're keeping our two oldest grandchildren and when they get upset, you know what they do? They turn their back to you. They don't want to talk to you. They don't want to look you in the face. They don't want to listen to you. Happened this week. And you have to tell them, no, turn and look at me. They don't want to. Jeremiah says, that's how your people have done since they got into this land you gave them. They've turned their back to you. They did their own thing. They went their own way. They made their own choices and didn't listen to what you told them. They didn't honor your name. That's why judgment is coming. The Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost to plant the church and to build the kingdom of God. He's still doing that. And the kingdom is about the name of the Lord. It's about honoring his name. It's about the whole earth honoring the name of the Lord God and of the Lord Jesus. We need to be a part of that. And then finally, not only God's power can do anything, God loves to be kind, God honors his name, but God's word is true. 
Jeremiah believed that. It was a core value of his life. What God says happens. What God says comes to pass. What God says works. And what God says doesn't work, doesn't work. Doesn't, I don't care how it looks, how it appears, how smart you think you are to figure it out better than anybody else. What God says doesn't work, doesn't work. God's word is true. In verse 24, Jeremiah says, The siege mounds have come up to the city to take it, and because of sword and famine and pestilence, this city is given into the hands of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke for the last 40 years, God, what you spoke has come to pass, and you see it. God saw it a long time before it happened. Do you know God sees the future? He sees next week. He sees next year. He's not discovering the future like we are. He's not unclear about the future like we are. He sees it. He knows it. He knows what's out there. He knows what's coming. Nothing that comes your way snuck up on God. It didn't take him by surprise. This COVID-19 certainly didn't. God knew it was coming. God sees the future. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows where all this is headed. His word always comes true because he sees it. It's not a mystery to him. Now there are more and more mysteries to me the longer I live. There are no mysteries to God. He gets it all. You understand that? You don't get a lot of it. God gets it all. He understands it all. He knows it all. He sees it all. Jeremiah has that deep-seated value conviction, truth in his life. God sees it all. God knows it all. His word is true. I think everybody has a time when they have to make a decision, what am I going to build my life on? And I think sometimes we do that over and over and over again. But I think in every life there is a sort of a real pivotal point where you have to choose. Am I going to listen to everything the world's telling me, to everything I'm hearing from college professors, from everything I'm hearing from the media, from everything I see around me, or am I going to build my life and believe the Word of God? I think everybody has to make that choice. And let me tell you, you're free to choose to go the way of this world's wisdom and this world's smarts and this world's instruction and this world's culture. You're, you're free to do that. Or you're free to say, God, I believe your word, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant my life firmly on it no matter what happens. And the Bible tells very clearly, and I'll tell you, I've lived long enough to see it in the lives of people. When you do it God's way, things turn out pretty well. When you do it the world's way, Things don't go so well. Oh, I'm not saying everything's perfect and you don't have any problems when you follow the Lord, but I'm urging you, believe the word of God. Plant your life on this. Let's bow together and pray. Heavenly Father, you see every heart you know every life. Lord, nothing is a mystery to you here. Jeremiah was so sure, and Lord, we believe you see it. You know what's going on. You know what life is. And Father, I pray that we would look in our heart and your Holy Spirit would search us. Search our heart. Lord, what are the core values we're living by? What are the things we really trust in? What are the things we're banking on? What are the things we're building our life on? What are the things we believe are true no matter what? Lord, if those don't line up with your word today, I pray, pray we'd really examine what we're doing here, what we think life is, why we think we're here, what we think we're doing, living, and where we think this is going. God, may we not just exist and bump along the way life pushes us, but may we go circumspectly, wisely, 
And I pray your Holy Spirit would help us to see clearly. How am I choosing to live? How am I making my choices day by day? And Lord, help us to be grounded today on your truth, on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, we're going to exit from the front, going up the middle aisles. If you'd like to speak with me, I'll wait here. And if you go to the outer aisle and come down, I'd love to talk with you. If there's anything that we need to talk about and I can help you with. Uh, Next week, we will have the Lord's Supper. Next week, uh, the ladies' class will meet in the fellowship hall. Adult four will meet in the gym. And the youth will be back in the youth room. And so some Sunday school classes are starting to open up and starting to meet again. Others are meeting off-site. Others have been doing Zoom. And some just aren't able to meet right now. And we understand that. And uh, we have our two oldest grandchildren, and uh, Diane's home with them today. We didn't think it was best to bring them, and that's, that's fine. I mean, if you're home and you don't think it's best to come, we want you to know that we love you, and we want you to stay home and do what you need to do and serve the Lord and join us online. And if you can come, we'd love for you to be here and worship again live. Uh, these are some of the weirdest days I've ever seen. And yet, I know God's on the throne. I know he has power to do anything. I know he sees the end from the beginning. I know none of this surprises him. I told him this week, I said, Lord, it sure would be nice to have some certainty about something. And you know what? I do have some certainty about something. God's word is true. God's got it figured out. I know how it ends. He told us how it ends. Jesus is coming back. He's on the throne. I have certainty about all the things that really matter. I just don't have certainty about all the immediate things that I really like, wish I could figure out. And I know you probably feel that way too, but hey, God knows. So let's stand together. We're not going to join hands, but we are going to exit as we sing, starting from the front. And again, if you'd like to speak with me, if you'll go to the outer aisle and come forward, please do that.